Hello, BookTube. I went to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston early this morning, <laughs> right after they opened. That's a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. It's three stories of jam-packed books, all at reasonable prices, even the collectible floor on the third floor where you can find a first edition or a rare item or something. Even there, the prices are acceptable. And the rest of the store, crammed full of 7 and $8 books. And a sale lot outside that's huge. Thousands more books for $1 a piece, $3 or $5. It was a beautiful, beautiful morning. The, morning was, the mornings now are retaining the cool of the evening in a way that presages winter. Uh, and I was there anyway. So I went to the Brattle, and I got a pile of books <laughs> that I want to show you. Uh, and uh, the pile of books, once again, illustrates a number of axioms about the Brattle. One of the things I always say about the Brattle is that it's great for second chances. Uh, if, like me, you cycle through a lot of books in your personal collection, and they come in, and for one reason or another, they go out again, and then they come in again, and then they go out again, uh, when that happens... You're going to look at some books that have gone out the back door and regret that, even if the, the reason why they went out the back door is praiseworthy. In my case, it's always something that I would not reverse. It's always that I'm sending it as a gift to somebody. I wouldn't take that back. Nevertheless, I, it does leave me with a lack. Uh, and the Brattle presents a great opportunity for second chances to, re to recover those things because, or even if it's a book that you saw and you think you took its measure, but it sticks with you, you know, after you've got rid of it, it sticks with you, and you're thinking, boy, I wish I still had that. I'd like to give it another go. Even things like that, the Brattle allows you second chances because their turnover is so high that you're almost certainly going to see those things again, and their prices are so reasonable, it's not going to be any pain to, to, re, to reacquire them and give them another try. That happens all the time to me. Another axiom that I often quote at the Brattle is that the Brattle will provide. I always say that when I am reading some collection of essays or I'm reading somebody's bibliography and I run across a mention of a book and I think, ah, I could really want that. I have a feeling from the way this is being discussed that I probably want that. Instead of immediately going onto eBay or Abe or whatever and running the risk of someone simply lying to me about the condition of what they're selling and paying through the nose, instead of that, I have gotten into the habit over the decades of simply saying the Brattle will provide. I won't forget that I'm interested in that book. Thankfully, I have at least a kind of memory where I don't forget those things. So that the next time I see it at the Brattle, and thanks to their turnover, I will, I can grab it. No need to rush out and get it right away. The Brattle will provide. And another thing that the Brattle provides is karma. I've mentioned many times before that the, that sale lot is not organized in any way except by price. Uh... No categories together, no formats together, no nothing like that. You don't know what you're going to find from day to day out there. It shifts all around. Uh, and you can't, therefore, go to the sale lot with a shopping list. You can't stand at the front of the sale lot with these thousands of books stretching out in front of you and say, I'm looking for this, this, and this, and then start looking for them. Not, not only will you not find those things, you won't find anything else that's of interest. That's not how the brattle works. That's not how the carts work. The carts are ruled by karma. You have to go with the flow. You have to start looking at the carts and start making connections between the various kinds of books that you see and realize what the Brattle sale carts are trying to present to you. <laughs> are they trying to present you with a $20, 20-book 20 collection of basic Western canon classics? Maybe that you don't have and maybe want to have? Is that what they're trying to do? Are they trying to present you with World War II history? Are they trying to present you with big art books, all of which you've seen for $60 new, that are now $5? You have to have an ear for that. You have to have an ear for what the carts will do. And the carts will often adhere to that karma in the same spirit of the Brattle will provide, maybe filling a lack you didn't know you had or weren't thinking about filling. All of that happened today. All of it did. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. It was terrific, as always. Uh, the the Brattle was training new sa uh, register help. He seemed a little iffy to me, but then again, he was dealing with me, and I'm always a problem. <laughs> so maybe I'm not a fair, a fair yardstick to use. But most of the time that I spent this morning, 
was spent in blissful solitude out there in the sale lot. I do shop inside the store. I do. I do. But mostly, it's the sale lot. Mostly, it's, it's, it's just blissfully probing around these old friends of mine. If you were to talk to Mark Richardson or Jason Harrigan or Todd Oval I, or Sean Stanfest, I know they would have the same reaction. But after a while, seeing these books, even if you don't plan to buy them, feels like communing with old friends. Oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, tell me more. I have that feeling anyway, and I love it. That feeling has saved my life at various very low points in my life when I have thought, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to do anything. Just let me go there and quietly browse around the books, and I will feel my soul stitching back together. Uh, I didn't have that any pressing need like that this morning. I was as happy as a clam. <laughs> I just recently unshouldered an enormous writing project that I, it's making me feel 20 pounds lighter even now, two, two days later. It's wonderful to have my own life back, my own reading and writing back, uh, and I celebrate it by going to the Brattle. I want to show you all of these things uh, and try and do some of them justice. So the first batch of things that I want to show you is a perfect example of a second chance at the Brattle. I had these things when they originally came out. I bought them new at the bookstore where I worked. Thought it was a great idea. Loved it. And then got rid of it. I got rid of the whole thing, the whole batch of these things. I think to a friend who was, who was a little bit uh, in between jobs, but really wanted these things, was as much a fan as I am. This is Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle's great creation, Sherlock Holmes. What you saw just the other day, I got uh, the two-volume collected Sherlock Holmes. This is quite different from that. These are old mass-market paperbacks, edited by the great, the legendary Otto Penzler, where he was given the brief to do a Sherlock Holmes library, not Sherlock Holmes short stories and novels but novels and short pieces about Sherlock Holmes. And he did. A beautiful, uniform library. That's what it's called. Otto Penzler presents the Sherlock Holmes Library. I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head how many books were in this library. I'm thinking that I didn't get them all. I saw these all in a block together for a dollar a piece. Of course, I grabbed the whole thing. Because I had these once upon a time, and I love them. Absolutely love them. Here you have... Uh, speculation about all the lacunae in Holmes's known biography. Here you have speculation about his history, about his family life, about his connections with Professor Moriarty. Here you have all sorts of extrapolation on Holmesiana. Just a wealth of it. Let me show you the individual ones. Here we have, uh, this is edited by James Edward Holroyd. These are, the reason it's edited, even though it's Otto Penzler's Sherlock Holmes Library, is because he pulled together all of these older books about Sherlock Holmes. He knew about them. He's a big Sherlock Holmes fan himself. He knew about them and wanted them reprinted for a new generation to appreciate. So here you have James Edward Holroyd edits 17 Steps to 221B. And this is just a collection of, uh, of writers writing about Sherlock Holmes. What's, what's in the table of contents here to give you an idea of what I'm talking about? From the Diary of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, A.A. Milne writes, Dr. Watson Speaks Out. Chronological Problems, uh, Studies in the Literature of, of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Desmond McCarthy does a profile of Dr. Watson. And so on and so forth. There's even Dorothy Sayers, I think, is in here. Uh, yes, The Dates in the Red-Headed League by Dorothy Sayers. One story, my favorite Sherlock Holmes story. One story. Let's go through the dates. Let's analyze this stuff as if it were real. So we have 17 steps to 221B. Then we have 221B, Studies in Sherlock Holmes by Vincent Starrett, the great Sherlock Holmes scholar. Here it is part of Otto Penzler's Sherlock Holmes Library. Then you have Baker Street Studies, edited by H.W. Bell, another collection of just miscellaneous writings, people interrogating one particular story or inconsistencies between one story and another. Here, reprinted in uniform mass market paperbacks. Here we have Our Holmes and Company by John Kendrick Bangs. Uh, Sherlock Holmes Fact or Fiction by T.S. Blakenley. Little thing. I had all these things. I read them and loved them. Uh, and finally, Baker Street Byways by James Edward Holroyd, uh, which is all uh, just a, a meditation on all kinds of aspects of Sherlock Holmes. What do we have for contents here? How It All Began, a study of Sidney Paget's illustrations, uh, a study of the furniture, 
at 221B Baker Street. Uh, a study of what exactly we know about Watson's gun. <laughs> Just fantastic stuff. Some of you may remember uh, there was a Star Trek publication called Trek Magazine. And for a long time, for years, there were mass market paperbacks called The Best of Trek. Number one, number two, number three. Trek did the same thing. It would just it was people just writing scholarly or pseudo scholarly pieces, wearing fiction, wearing the gnawing at the little tedious details, the trivia of these fictional creations. Those best of Trek volumes were fantastic, even if they weren't canon, of course. And the speculations in these are also fantastic. And I never thought I'd run across even one of these things, much less all of them together. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I have them all. Okay, no, I know that I don't have them all. Because Vincent Starrett's book, uh, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, which is great on its own, is also in this volume, in this series, and so is something called My Dear Holmes, Studies in Sherlock by Gavin Brend. So I know I don't have them all. Uh, but I now have, you know, a, half a dozen of them, which is great. Uh, don't plan on getting rid of these again. I'm a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. Not just rereading the stories, but rereading Sherlockiana. So I grabbed them, of course. Uh, then this next one, uh, a little call out to Shake Timber, a booktube event all about Shakespeare, celebrating Shakespeare in the month of September. This is a classic. This is John Dover Wilson's What Happens in Hamlet uh, that I've had, you know, on and off throughout the, this came out in the 1950s, I think. Uh, 1935, okay. But this, this particular uh, edition uh, came out, I think, in 1960. You know, you can't really, well, you can't really tell. This is wider than a normal mass market paperback. And it's also more, po more poorly made. I've never seen what happens in Hamlet in hardcover. Uh, but I've seen it often in this very distinctive paperback, and I love it. It's just John Dover Wilson writing about Hamlet, writing a whole book about Hamlet. I love it. There are parts of it that I know well enough almost to quote from memory, but I, can, I never have a copy when I want one. So, just like these, we'll fill out the aforementioned Sherlock Holmes shelf that all of us that are Sherlock Holmes fans have. Shakespeare fans also have a Shakespeare shelf, or more than one. I am very much, I'm closing in on a Shakespeare bookcase uh, of books uh, by and about. And this is a classic book about, just classic. Uh, I love it. I will give it a reread. I don't expect uh, this paperback to survive that reread. The reason that I don't have what happens in Hamlet, the reason why I have to buy it all the time, is largely because it's so poorly made that I that I, one read with a pencil in hand tears it apart. Maybe someday somebody will print it in a hardcover that, or maybe it exists in a hardcover and I've just never seen it at the Brattle. It'd be great either way. Uh, then we have, I believe this is a UK trade paperback. There was no way that I was going to pass this up. Uh, this is a historian that I really, really like, and this is uh, the one volume of his that I absolutely have to have, and I didn't have it because I had the crappy American hardcover that didn't look good at all. This is the great Peter Ackroyd, who has been doing a multi, he just finished, a multi-volume biography, a multi-volume history of England. Uh, and it was, it wasn't Whig history, but it was, it was very much popular history. It was meant to break things down into very digestible epochs that aren't unpredictable. He's not doing anything unpredictable here. Instead, you're coming to it mainly for the vivacity of his prose. And I loved it right from the beginning. I reviewed a couple of them. Uh, one for, I think, the Washington Post, one for the Christian Science Mart. I didn't review them all. Uh, but the one that I wanted above all others in a, in a paperback was volume two, The Tudors. <laughs> And I found a UK trade paperback of the Tudors. It's n a lot nicer looking than any American version that I would have. I haven't seen um, the American version. I don't even know if the American version has a paperback. Probably it does. I, I've never seen used, I've never seen any volumes of this series in American or UK editions of any kind. The UK edition here has all sorts of blurbs from the Mail on Sunday and the Daily Mail and, you know, the... the Weekly Standard and whatnot. I don't know if uh, the American trade paperbacks of any of these things have my blurb on them. I have no idea, uh, and I don't. I'm. I'm not. I'm not going to rush right out and find out. But I have this now, and I loved this volume. 
of all the volumes, this one and the last one, the one that covers years that Aykroyd actually remembers, personally. That was the latest volume. That and this are, were my two favorites. So I'm very, very happy to have this, even though I need another uh, popular study of the Tudors, like I need an extra hole in the head. I, I got it anyway, uh, because I'm going to have such a joy rereading this now that I have it in the form that I want. That's fantastic. And we're going to be dealing uh, with history and biography. That's what this is. This is history and biography. And we're going to be dealing with history and biography in this Brattle Hall. But that's going to come at the end. First, for the next huge block of books that we're going to be dealing with, we're going to be dealing with another ramification of the Brattle will provide, which is that sometimes the Brattle, by mystic means known only to itself, seems to know when you have room in your library. <laughs> I mentioned just recently uh, that I had a horrible spacing problem with my collection of books about books, about reading, collections of prefaces, collections of book reviews, uh, publishing memoirs, that sort of thing. I had a huge number of those things. I love them. They're some of my favorite things to read. They are my profession. So if, if I'm reading something about the current state of book reviewing, well, almost every writer in that, in that heading has written something about the current state of book reviewing, going back once every decade for the last nine decades. Worth worth consulting if I'm reading a new book about Otto von Bismarck. Half those people will have written something about Otto von Bismarck. It's very interesting to read that and maybe annotate and maybe chase down references, see if anybody has the same reference in, in two different pieces that don't know each other. Uh, that collection has grown. It grows. I find books like that all the time, and I absolutely love them. So I grab them whenever I find them. And uh, eventually, here in this new iteration of Hyde Cottage, uh, I, that bookcase just became just fatally crowded. I, it wouldn't work anymore. So I had to move it. I moved it to a new bookcase out in this middle room that goes floor to ceiling. I thought, okay, you'll have no problem here whatsoever. In an instant, in an instant, that new bookcase was completely full. <laughs> So I, I, I engaged in the beginning of, I mentioned the other day, I call it Operation Harrigan, after Jason Harrigan. And I, I mistakenly gave the impression in an earlier video this week that Operation Harrigan was done. It's not. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Operation Harrigan is a total soup to nuts reevaluation of my entire physical book collection. In light of the fact that I have 10,000 ebooks. In light of that fact, I need to revisit the whole concept of my physical print book collection. But the first part of Operation Harrigan, the part that I wanted to get done first, was to fix the problem of overcrowding on that particular bookcase. No other section of my library is used as much, and no other section of my library grows as fast. So that problem needed to be fixed, and I did fix it. It was a little bit of labor, but it was when it was done, not only did all those books fit with no doubling, on their new home, but that new home had room for expansion, which was key. I have offered a number of uh, rather arrogant phrasings about how much expansion. I'm saying, bah, it'll never reach its limits. And clearly the Brattle was listening, <laughs> because the next gigantic wadge of stuff that I'm going to show you are all books that are going in that new bookcase, making me for the first time in a month wonder if maybe there is enough room. <laughs> I don't know what to do. That is the biggest space that I have. If that is overgrown, I don't know what to do. Uh, but anyway, that's the next 10 books. <laughs> Starting with this cute little thing. This is uh, Oxford World Classics. This is edited by Harold Beaver. And this is American Critical Essays, the 20th century. And there you have some of the people involved here who are writing just critical essays. It's one of these tiny little mass market paperbacks. This is even smaller uh, than, than one of these Sherlock Holmes volumes. Uh, and I used to love these things because I considered it the ultimate bang for the buck in terms of both durability and space. But uh, the print, I, my eyes are 28 years old now, and the print can sometimes be a little bit of a trial. Uh, but I was, I, I'm never going to see a collection like this again, so I grabbed it. Here we have uh, H.L. Mencken. We have Ezra Pound whose dates are given here, the birth and death dates are given. H.L. Mencken is given 1880 to 1956. Ezra Pound is given 1885-, because he hadn't yet died when this came out. Uh, Van White Brooks, his essay on Theodore Dreiser. Uh, we've got Edmund Wilson on Flaubert. 
uh, Horace Gregory, uh, on uh, Poets Without Critics, a note on Robertson Jeffers. I can't stand Robertson Jeffers, but I love Horace Gregory. So, And on and on and on uh, throughout here. You've got just canonical writers and canonical critics. This is going to go on that new expanded bookcase. It's not going to take up much room, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it has a huge amount of company. Oh, look at this beautiful thing. This is from Pushkin Press on reading, writing, and living with books. Again, a tiny little thing. What is this? This contains uh, How One Should Read a Book by Virginia Woolf, which I have in that bookcase already in a beautiful, ornate little hardcover. A letter from Charles Dickens to Wilkie Collins. A letter from Charles Dickens to George Eliot. Uh, the, uh, the essay Authorship by George Eliot, My Books by Leigh Hunt, and The London Library by E.M. Forster. Those are all reprinted in this little, this lovely little volume on books and reading. Great. Terrific. Most of these were free or a dollar. Wasn't going to leave any of them behind. But then we have uh, a great librarian. I can't call him the greatest librarian because, well, he was a great librarian in his day. He's dead, as far as I know, so Mark Richardson is still the greatest librarian I know. <laughs> I know three librarians now for my sins. <laughs> One is uh, has been with the same library in Italy for a very long time, and his collection is just a bit on the enviable side, but he doesn't have much in the way of patrons. Then one is, is an official at a big, prosperous a uh, major northeastern urban library that the type will have divisions and branches and that'll have multiple people involved and managerial and other sides. And the third <laughs> librarian that I know is Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads, a fellow booktuber, who's not just a librarian, he's a library director of a gorgeous little library in small town Vermont. You have to see the Weathersfield Park to Library to believe it. It is a class act right down to the ground. Uh, this next person was also a librarian. He was the, the president. Is, is it the president of the American Library Association? Does they have a president, a chair, a czar, or whatever? He was in charge of the American Library Association and was an advocate of reading, a passionate advocate of reading, like all librarians I've ever known have been. Uh, the, the, the stereotype of a prim spinster who mainly lives to tell people, shh, could not be any further from the truth. And also, I might point out, that stereotype took root in the early decades of the 20th century. And in the early decades of the 20th century, librarians all throughout the American Midwest were saying, oh, I don't know where this stereotype comes from. It's certainly not true here. We don't care if you're a child, an adult, an older person, you can come in and talk to your heart's content. Uh, this, the, what I'm trying to say is this guy was a really good guy, and I have not read this book Probably it will not be anything new to me, but I will definitely read it because I know that it will glow with that love of reading. This is Books That Changed the World by Robert Downs. In a Signet Classic, I had no idea this thing even existed. I thought I saw all the Signet Classics when I was selling them in bookstores. But when did this, when did this edition of Signet Classics come out? This had to come out when I was in bookstores. Uh, what have we got here for Signet? Well, maybe not. No, first Signet Classic print in March 2004. I was still working in bookstores in March 2004. No idea how I missed this. Can't wait. This is just, it runs you down a, uh, a predictable list, you know, uh, The Wealth of Nations, uh, Nicomachean Ethics, The Confessions of St. Augustine, that, the, the Prince, uh, The Essays of Bacon, that sort of thing. It won't be anything new. I won't be encountering anything new here. But it's always worth reading someone thinking about those familiar old books. Always. Especially since I know this writer really well and I've never read this book. Terrific. And another addition to that bookcase, which you can see is starting to look a little worried. And we're nowhere near. We've just started. This next one, never seen it before. The novelist J.B. Priestley is the one who, who introduces this. It's an everyman anthology. Lovely little hardcover with a dust jacket. Uh, issued to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Every Man's Library. Uh, and this is a, arranged in unsigned post subject sequence. The excerpts, grave and gay, predominantly prose, spotlight every man's interests and activities. So is that what we have here? I just grabbed it. I knew already that, that I wanted to see it. Book-loving authors. Uh, oh, my. Uh, okay, yes. 
So this is this is just a big anthology. When when the uh, cover copy says unsignposted, what that means is that you're not being it, there are no big headings. You're supposed to just get lost in this thing with excerpts from various everyman volumes over this over the decades. Incredible. <laughs> I've never seen this before. I imagine that a lot of the stuff that's in here is going to be about literature. So We'll see. If it's more than 50% about literature, it goes on that bookcase, along with all the rest of these things. Then we have uh, Jacques Bonnet. This is Phantoms on the Bookshelves, with an introduction by Ur Dude Bro author James Salter. Uh, this, I believe, is the author's library. Uh, so is that what we've got here? This enthralling study on the art of living with books considers how our personal libraries reveal our true natures. Far more than merely crowded shelves, they are living labyrinths of our inner feelings. <laughs> Gotta read this, right? It's not long. It won't take any time at all. The author, a lifelong accumulator of books ancient and modern, lives in a house large enough to accommodate his many thousands of volumes, as well as overspill from the libraries of his friends. <laughs> Phantoms on the bookshelf. Could not pass it up. Exactly the kind of book we're talking about here. I will read it. If I like it, I will keep it. And if I keep it, it will go on those shelves. And I will just have to make the room now, won't I? And then this next one very much goes over there, although it's it's not like the others. This is called Dear Mr. Murray. Look at how lovely this hardcover is. This is about the 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 publisher, uh, the the famous publisher of, uh, for instance, John ba of the Lord Byron, John Murray, for for. Generations and generations, the Murrays were in charge of, of the Murray Publishing House. And they got letters from everybody, not just cranks off the street, but also all their famous authors. Uh, and this is a volume to celebrate that. See, we've, there you've got some of the names of people who, who have written them over the centuries. Fantastic. I don't think I've ever seen this thing before. I don't doubt that this is not this was never printed in America. This is probably a John Murray uh, publication. Yes? Yeah, yeah, this is a John Murray publication, so I would never have seen this. I saw it today at the Brattle, but I've never seen it in a new bookstore. No way. Uh, then we have Tim Parks. I believe this is also a UK publication. This is Pen in Hand. Reading, rereading, and other mysteries. This is all about reading. Uh, there are, I think, some dedicated pieces in here about authors. How I read in search of authenticity. Do flashbacks work in literature? Uh, the books we don't understand. Stories we can't see. Too many books? All kinds of bookish essays of the type I just love. I can't get enough of this kind of reading. And I've never seen this before. So I grabbed it. Uh, but we're not done. We're still moving on. These are all books that are going in that section. Oh, I found it just a vein of them all at once. This next one is a sequel of a kind. I'm going to need to reinforce this. This is The Loud Literary Llamas of New York by Jack Woodford. who was It's a thin little thing. He was a, a sort of a hack author in his day, in the 1950s, had tons and tons of books, wrote all the time, wrote really fast, wrote for money, wrote the, you know, interesting thrillers, that sort of thing. And he started out by writing, the reason I call this a sequel is because he wrote an expose of the American publishing industry in really harsh language, harsh but honest language. He wrote, I think it was called Trial and Error, Tried and Convicted, something like that. That earlier book I do not have. I've read it, but I don't have it. And this is a sequel to that. Llamas here not being the animal, but rather the holy person. Uh, which is just a huge, unencumbered attack on the abuses of the publishing industry. God knows what Woodford would make of today's publishing industry. I don't even know. A lot of the sins are the same from one generation to the next, but the publishing industry in the 21st century has managed to come up with a whole bunch of new sins. Uh, this is going to be fantastic to read. I don't think I've ever read it. I read the first one. Uh, uh, tried and convicted, or trial and error, whatever it was called. I read the first. I wonder if it says in here uh, what it, what that first one was called. Uh, trial and error. It was called trial and error. I've read that one. I haven't read this one. Fantastic. Just totally fun. And also really thin. A lot of these things I can do in half an hour. So a large number of these things I will read, you know, relatively quickly. I'll read them before I put them on those shelves. Then these next two. A crown prince of my own profession, the great Cyril Connolly. I mentioned the uh, the other day I got two collections of Gore Vidal essays, despite the fact that I have his enormous volume, United States. Uh, and I mentioned at the time that I, the reason I do that is because 
the author, as the decades go on, is looking at those previous essay collections in order to pick essays from them for the great big, you know, magnum opus that is the United States in this case, but you know, evenings on the colonnade or whatever, if you're Cyril Connolly. In, in any case, uh, when it's left to the writer to do that instead of an editor of a literary executive, the writer is going to pick things from those earlier volumes. They're not just going to take the whole of the earlier volume. And if you love the writer, as I do Gore Vidal, as I do Cyril Connolly, you're going to want those earlier volumes. You're going to want everything that this author wrote. I found two of those. The first one is uh, The Condemned Playground. Very happy this has one of these plastic covers on it because uh, it would be in rough shape otherwise. And this has 36 essays, including, I believe, uh, there's a, he wrote a classic one called 90 Years of Novel Reviewing that is a must read if you have ever reviewed a novel. You've just got to find it and read it. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's in here. Yes, yes it is. Uh, and lots of other things too, including little squibs, little two-page things that he would leave out of larger collections. I don't want anything left out. I want to read them. So I, I found The Condemned Playground, and I also found uh, Previous Convictions, another big collection of his nonfiction. I wonder if this one has uh, 90 years of novel reviewing as well. Pro it might. An author would go from, uh, wow, oh, this has his two essays on Hemingway, his three on Joyce, his three on Fitzgerald. The essays on Hemingway are uh, heartbreaking, because the first essay on Hemingway is about through the river and through the trees and to the river, or across the river and to the trees, whatever it is, Venice book, uh, that was bad even by Hemingway fan standards. Uh, Connolly reviewed that book, and he didn't like it. He, he starts his review, this was from the 1950s, I think, he starts his review by saying every once in a while a great author will write a bad book, just an objectively bad book, and then it falls to the, to the reviewer to figure out why that is and how to explain it to the reader. And at the end of that essay, he calls through the river and to the woods or whatever that what it has a dumb title too what whatever he calls that complete a complete failure and then ends his review by saying what Hemingway clearly needs to do and here I'll take the liberty of addressing the author directly is shed his earlier self give up the taste for hard liquor give up the taste for this lacrimose sentimentality about the machismo of the past reinvent your talent for where you are now as a world name, as a titan of literature. Reinvent your talent along those lines instead of continuously going back to this old well. That's what you need to do now. A rare example of a critic speaking directly to an author and telling them what they need to do. And instead of doing that, Hemingway killed himself. And Connolly's next essay, the next one of the Hemingway essays, has to start by trying to come to grips with the fact that Hemingway has killed himself. Uh, and there's lots of other stuff in here, too. I, God knows how much in here or in this one I haven't already read. But even the things that I have read, I want to reread them. This doesn't have a plastic mylar thing. So I will clean as much of the dirt off it as I can and then reinforce it myself, because I never plan on getting rid of this. Every time I mention reinforcing books, the preservation purists among you always harp on me about how I'm destroying the resale value of the book. I know that perfectly well. I'm not planning on reselling the book, and I don't care what happens to it after I'm gone. Oh, I don't care about that. <laughs> so I'm preserving them for my own use in my own reading life, and boy, oh boy, are these going to get a lot of use. But we're still not done. This is, this is a 10-book edition to a new area of my library. Tell me the Brattle does not provide. The gods were watching. I'm not sure what I can do if I have ten more editions, <laughs> but the last one is this lovely thing. I think this might also be uh, a UK edition. Yeah, this is Bodleian Library. Uh, this is uh, the Book Lovers Anthology. Lovely thing. That's all about uh, all the different kinds of books, poetry about books, essays about books, passages of diaries or travel diaries or memoirs about books. Just a loving anthology that was put together by the Bodleian Library, probably sold on the premises. Someone must have bought a copy, come, come all the way across the pond, maybe shop, maybe realize, well, I've got too much other stuff. I've got to sell a bag of books at this shop. And that's how this and the Murray book came into my possession. I don't know how it happened. I'm very happy that it did. I will lovingly go through this. Uh, not only for quotes that I really love or quotes that are new to me, but also for quotes that I can use. Uh, and that is it. That was a gigantic block 
of books about books, books about reading, books about publishing, all at once. Uh, that plus every last, uh, the last five or six trips to the Brattle uh, have had additions to that bookcase. So the, the gods are really putting it to the test. These are still not going to overcrowd it. But, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, then we, I said a history and biography to end things off, and we are going to end things off here. This is something that I got from Basic Books in a trade paperback about 10 years ago. Thought, okay, another book on the subject, but I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It is so quotable. It is so enjoyable to read, even if you don't agree with the author. I have a feeling that I wouldn't like this author at all, if he's still alive. I have a feeling that I wouldn't like him, his politics at all. But what a book to read. It's about the end of the Cold War. And it's called The Atlantic and Its Enemies by Norman Stone. I got rid of that trade paperback because I got the distinct impression. I was tipping essays inside it. I was making notes in it. I was got the distinct impression that if I kept doing that, it would blow apart. It would just fall into pieces. This hardcover can take the abuse. So it joins, I think I have five other books on the Cold War, uh, which I lived through uh, from start to finish. So, so I feel like it's my war in a way that World War II is not. And that World War One is not either, okay? You wags out there. Uh, but it isn't, it wouldn't be just the immediacy of it. It's that this is so well done. It is so enjoyable. I found it in hardcover, so I grabbed it. And then the last book for our Brattle trip today is a quintessential example of the Brattle will provide. The other day we had, I mentioned, a raucous Q&A. Uh, and in that Q&A, somebody asked if I knew any good biographies of William Tyndale. The pioneering... Uh, Bible translator translated the Bible into English had to flee Henry VIII's England for fear for his life it was and it was death to anyone who even sold one of his English translations it I he was on my mind Tyndale was on my mind because he his ghost hovers over Hillary Mantel's Wolf Hall he never makes an appearance of course because it's it's Cromwell's book and Cromwell never leaves England in the time except when he's in the presence of the king he certainly doesn't go to Antwerp to hunt down William Tyndale uh, but Tyndale hovers over the whole book. Thomas More is busy racking, burning, and killing people who are even suspected of selling one of these English language Bibles. And Cromwell is involved as well. And there are a couple of points in Wolf Hall where he mentions where, you know, the women folk in his life or the, his students will say, why are people so upset about this? What's in this thing? And he'll say, in those scenes, he very quietly says, well, it's more a question of what's not in them. <laughs> when you, when it makes it clear, Cromwell makes it clear in the course of the book that he himself has read the Bible in English. He, he says it's more a question of what's not in there. Think of all the rules that the church has right now and then try and find them anywhere in the Bible. <laughs> so, Tyndall never makes an appearance, but he's a very strong presence in Wolf Hall. And in the course of that uh, Q&A, I mentioned that there was one biography of him that I really, really loved. And I got rid of it. I had it years ago and got rid of it, and that I really want to find it again, and I did. I found it today. This is David Daniels' biography of William Tyndale. This is a terrific biography. Just terrific. And now I have it again. <laughs> in fact, I have it. Well, when I had this before, I had it in uh, a trade paperback. And now I have the hardcover, so I, it, it's a classic biography, a perfectly uh, good example of a keeper. Something that I will keep, that I will hold on to. So there you go. That was our Brattle trip. I believe this will be the only Brattle trip today. Tomorrow, the weather forecasts right now are saying that tomorrow is going to be 84 or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That is not true. Boston is going to reach triple digits tomorrow. Boston is going to reach at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow by midday. So I don't know why weather forecasters are saying otherwise. When you can take equipment outside and document that they're off by 15 degrees. Either way, it's my estimate is that it's going to be triple digits tomorrow and chokingly humid, so not a day to go out and do any kinds of book logging or errands of any kind. And then the rest of the week, I think, is rain. So I probably won't be going back to the Brattle until next week. I think I've, got, I've gotten enough books this week already, and the week is only halfway over. Uh, so we have William Tyndale. Uh, the uh, David Daniel, <laughs> George Salzman, Mount Auburn Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's where this library came from. Okay. Uh, we have William Tyndale. We have David Daniel's biography of, of Tyndale. Fantastic. 
then we have The Atlantic and Its Enemies by Norman Stone. Uh, then we have a bunch of books about books. Book Lovers Anthology, uh, Previous Convictions and the Condemned Playground by the great Cyril Connolly. We have The Loud Literary Llamas of New York by Jack Woodford, Crying, Tilting Against Windmills. We have Pen in Hand by Tim Parks. Uh, we have Dear Mr. Murray. Look at how pretty this thing is. Letters to the famous, uh, to the famous publishing house. We have Phantoms on the Bookshelves by Jacques Bonnet. Probably he was some sort of French snooty patootie intellectual. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, an Everyman Anthology. Beautiful thing uh, with a dust jacket. Then we have The Tudors by Peter Ackroyd in a UK trade paperback. We have What Happens in Hamlet by John Tover Wilson, a, a, re for the billion, a rebuy for the billionth time. We have On Reading, Writing, and Living with Books, just a handful of very short meditations on those subjects. We have The Books That Changed the World by the great Robert Downs. What I wouldn't give for more of this guy's writing, but I'll, I'll take his, what is clearly his most accessible book. We have American Critical Essays, a tiny little Oxford World Classics volume. And finally, we have Otto Penzler's Sherlock Holmes Library in these uniform mass market paperbacks. Uh, I'm not, I don't have them all. I'm missing a couple. Uh, but how's that? Uh, for a brattle pile, <laughs> for a steam pyramid, you can't do much better than that. <sighs> it's going to be a lot of fun reading that I'm going to sprinkle in with all the duty-bound reading that I have to do later today. Uh, so I, I just wanted to share it with you, that's all. It was a wonderful, wonderful time, uh, and it wasn't overly hot. That's coming tomorrow, but it wasn't true today. It was a cool, bright, beautiful morning, like walking around in a swimming pool. Uh, so I have a lot of goodies to inventory and clean up and then poke around in. I, my reading tonight will suffer, but that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I don't I don't find a pile like this all that often. You know, despite the fact that you've got, I've got all these books about books, all these literary essays of, of the type of reading I love to do, how much you want to make a bet that it's going to be Peter Aykroyd banging on about the Tudors, that actually does win the race <laughs> tonight? How much you want to make a bet? I wouldn't take that bet. I think that's very likely. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.